You are listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, where we believe the Bible is sufficient and answers life's problems. I'm your host, Pastor Jeff Christensen. This podcast is for everyone in the body of Christ, staff pastor, church leader, caring homemaker, the responsible businessman, everybody. But it's also for my Calvary Chapel University students. Shout out, hello to you guys. All of us are called to offer counsel regularly. And we every day need a word of counsel from the Lord. So these episodes are designed to assist you in learning to give godly counsel. Also to develop discernment in evaluating counsel that you receive. So it's my prayer that these podcasts, that these episodes will enlarge your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a wonderful counselor. God bless you. Grab your Bibles. Let's get started. See you on the inside. Hey, so welcome back to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. This is our second week with Dr. Bill Hines in studio, and we're walking through 2 Timothy. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us. Make sure you leave a comment in the community. That's where we uh, interact with one another, and I know uh, Dr. Hines will be in the community with you. But we left off on 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. And so we're going to jump in there and pick up where we left off last time. Uh, where's Where are you thinking we're going with this? Well, as we talked about last time, Timothy is very dear to Paul and vice versa. And Paul wants to be sure that Timothy is not left with any weakness mm. uh, theologically or within his own heart in terms of following Christ. And so that's part of the reason for this letter, I'm sure. And as we looked at uh, how, how Paul relates to Timothy, perhaps how you and I relate to our kids, where we want to equip them, not just leave them a bunch of money to live the rest of their lives comfortably, but we want to leave them with a great legacy in the Lord so that they are following him so that we can all be together forever in heaven together. Um, one day, I know that is most important to me Yeah, with my kids. And so as we help others, as we help disciple people uh, in biblical counseling, which is discipleship, uh, I say, and as our students are working at this, we come to this great passage that we all refer to in biblical counseling, that all scripture is inspired by God, and it tells us why. But let me ask you, first of all, to walk us through a little bit what this means to be inspired by God. Yeah, all Scripture, uh, the Word of God, is inspired by God. Uh, scripture is not only uh, what we would call inerrant. We, we speak of the inerrancy of Scripture. It can be trusted that it that the transmission of the uh, original author's manuscripts was uh, uh, supervised supernaturally by God, and we trust the inspiration of God that the scriptures, the translation that we have in our hand is accurate, and we can trust it, and that it is um, it is inerrant. So, so we believe in the inerrancy. We also believe in the authority of Scripture. Uh, scripture is authoritative. It's our final uh, arbitrator. We we filter everything through the scripture concerning life and godliness and, and the worldview we have, and it it's final. We we look to the authority. It's also clear, or uh, uh, the perspicuity of the word of God, that it's the clarity of the word that a child can read it and understand it. And so we're talking about the son in the faith or the daughter in the faith, and in children's ministry and in raising children. Uh, teach them doc doctrinal words or big theories and thoughts in the Word of God because they can understand it because Scripture is meant to be understood and read in the clarity of Scripture. But here it says it's inspired, uh, and I would say that means God breathed. The very heart and the very mind of God has been communicated. He used, uh, you know, 
uh, 66 books with 40 authors, and each author had a personality, a background, an education, a language, and he used their uh, abilities and, you know, it wasn't uh, used them as a, you know, uh, automatron or uh, like we would call today AI, you know, artificial intelligence and that he just moved uh, them to write like a puppet. But he used their personalities and the relationship he had with them to write exactly what God wanted to write to humanity. His very mind is breathed out. And so because of all of those things that describe the scripture, that it is inspired of God, that it is authoritative, that it is inerrant, that it is clear, per, the perspicuity of the scripture, that it is necessary for life and godliness, all because of that, it's sufficient. Everything there that we need for life and godliness to please God, to make disciples, to navigate our our uh, walk on planet Earth until we go home, we have the all-sufficient uh, Word of God. I, I love talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you, you mentioned how God used the, uh, the temperament types or the personalities of different people. He didn't change uh, their personalities. He didn't make them all sound the same. For instance, uh, when in seminary, uh, when we're studying uh, Greek uh, and all, they always have a start in John because John wrote in a more simple Greek than did Paul. Now, all of it was inspired of God. All of it was God-breathed, but he used the, the personality type, if you will, of each author, yeah. and we find that throughout Scripture. Uh, just like uh, with you and I, he uh, uses your personality, uses mine, we may come at things a little differently, but it's the same Scripture, and it's the same God, mm -hmm. and we're relying on the same Spirit. Yeah, that's awesome. Love it. You know, it's interesting, too, that um, I, I looked over here in, in 2 Peter 3. We're talking about Scripture, and uh, Peter says in verse 14 of 2 Peter 3, Therefore, beloved, since you look to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him wrote, that he wrote to you, as also in all of his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. Now, what's one of the many things interesting to me about that is Peter refers to the writings of Paul as scripture. Yeah, beautiful. And, of course, he's likening that to the Old Testament at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we look at here, all scripture is inspired, the scripture written down by the apostles, by those that came in this first century, we know is God breathed and is inspired on the same level as the Old Testament. Yeah. Well, he goes on and he says that it's profitable for teaching and reproof. How would you pick apart those words? You know, I I I would look at the the doctrine the the doctrine of the Word of God, the reproof, the correction, the instruction in righteousness is what how God has designed people to be equipped for every good work. So the equipping of a biblical counselor, the equipping of a child, the equipping of a mentor that would disciple a younger person is going to be thoroughly done by the Word of God because the Word of God has a, a doctrinal ability to sort out truth. It has um, uh, reproof to um, bring correction or, you know, if you're like, I love the word correction because it's as if when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm living life and I get off center, the word of God corrects my path. And so it brings correction. Reproof is uh, you know, in your translation, it's different. What does yours say? 
Well, this one says profitable teaching and for reproof. This for one repro- says okay, reproof. it says reproof. So doctrine is, would be the biblical theology, the biblical teaching, the biblical uh, doctrine. Doctrine is not a bad word. It just means teaching. It means, yeah. <laughs> it means the good. teaching of the Scripture. It's a good <laughs> word. A lot of people don't like the word doctrine. But reproof is like to, um, to challenge and say, you know, I like to say it's almost like the word very similar to the word uh, uh, admonition. Whereas, mm-hmm. here's your life, you call yourself a Christian, here's the teaching or the doctrine, the scripture, explain yourself. That's kind of reproof, but mm-hmm. correction helps you then get back on track, and then instruction in rightness or right way of living. And uh, it's all there. Scripture ha- is, is profitable and sufficient for these things. And this is, I think, more profitable than learning about science and the life of a salamander. How fascinating to learn about biology. But, uh, and how important to learn mathematics and the Fibonacci numbers and, you know, and, and to know, and to know calculus and to know, uh, trigonometry and to know geometry. That's fascinating. And, and to be able to communicate in the English language, there's nothing that, and to know literature and to know, um, uh, and to know history and to be a good, uh, in physical fitness and to learn finances. All of that is great. But it pales in comparison to knowing God. And that's what the scripture is is there for, that I might know Jesus. And that I might know him and go forth and make him know. There's no greater priority in the universe than to know my Lord Jesus Christ and have an intimate relationship. How does he communicate to me? He communicates to me through the word of God. And it's profitable for these things, but most importantly, Importantly, it's so that I get to know him. And when I get to know him, I get hungry and I want to know him more. And I develop an appetite and I devour the word of God. And that's what I want for those young people that I disciple, that they would fall in love with Jesus and get to know him through the study of the word of God. So scripture is profitable. What a beautiful scripture that is. And for every good work, including being trained as a biblical counselor, a lot of biblical counseling is trained using topics. I say the best biblical counselor knows the Bible. Amen. You know, so there you go. Amen. In fact, when people would ask me in the earlier days what biblical counseling books I liked the most, of course, the Bible was first. But beyond that, I would say, well, this systematic theology mm-hmm. helps me see how all the Bible fits together. Yeah. And these commentaries help me see how it, how how what this really means. Yeah. I didn't go to the hottest self-help book mm-hmm. out there. And and I'm a writer, uh, and I've written a, what some might consider a health self-help book, but you, we got to start with the Scripture. we yeah. got to know theology. we got to yeah. know what this book says. And it's interesting to me here, this, in, in my New American Standard, it talks about training in righteousness and training as you might a child. And I know that there are some people that if you tell them they have sinned, uh, well, some people just can't handle that. But sometimes they just, it just deflates them. But to me, there's a good news aspect to that. Yeah. Because Christ has done something about sin. And this training in righteousness is bringing us out of that fleshly nature and teaching us how to walk rightly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, too, instruction and training in righteousness, uh, that that has to do with, you know, describing sin as missing the mark as compared to transgression and what, what harmatia, that Greek word, is and what it means. It was more of a, you know, the archery and the bullseye and you missed the mark and then how it's applied in the sinfulness of missing God's glory, for we have all sinned and fall short of that 
glory of God, that God desires us to be perfectly loving and perfectly holy and like God in everything that we do, and we miss that mark, but it should be a tutor to drive us to Christ. And when people are condemned, they're being condemned by the enemy, but when they're convicted, it should drive them for repentance and then when we repent, there are times of refreshing that are available to us, and uh, we have to grow in those things. You know, that's why I have the incredible shrinking church, because I preach repentance <laughs> and uh, talk about sin, and I don't know that people hear that uh, from every pulpit across America. Maybe they do, but I know what they hear here, and, and we're going to be talking about uh, the gospel and the bad news first before we tell them the good news. Right. Well, I remember saying one time, uh, when I was young, that that we can't really teach life until we first teach death in sin. Yeah. Because we can talk about being alive in Christ, but that makes no sense unless we understand that we are dead in sin and we need to be made alive yeah. in Christ. Great. Um, I I wonder also what you think about about this idea that you know a lot of couples. Uh, somebody will say, well, you did this wrong, uh, you've sinned. And the other, the spouse will say, will be upset, say, well, I don't like how you said that. You know, you were unkind, you weren't generous in how you said it, you weren't, and, you know, just deflecting. Now, to me, the first question to ask is, but are they right? Mm -hmm. If my wife says to me, you sinned in this specific way, even if she said it in a what I perceive as a mean way, the real question for me is, is she right? Mm-hmm. Because if she is, if it's in the Scripture, I need to consider that very seriously. Yeah, I just wonder if you might talk about that. Yeah, thank you for asking. I think there's what's uh, uh, approachability, entreatability, uh, humility, are good character qualities of a man of God, that you would be willing and open to hearing a criticism and asking the Lord if what is said is true, even though it might have been spoken in a manner that was offensive. And, you know, as a pastor, I hear criticisms. I get the emails. I'll get the text messages. I'll sit down with somebody and I'll have a, uh, you know, a three ring binder full of notes by the time I'm done. And, and I'll have to sit there in humility and say, is there anything else after an hour of being excoriated? And I have to die to self to be able to not defend myself. Let God be my defender. And I think how important it is to walk in that humility and to be willing to say, is there anything else? Well, thank you. What I'm going to do is take these notes and pray over them and ask the Lord to shine the light of His Holy Spirit, the convicting word of His Holy Spirit, and filtered through the Word of God. And if there's something here that I need to repent over, I will repent. And if I need to come before you and ask for forgiveness, I will do that. And and that diffuses a, a interpersonal relationship. Well, now, personally, now you want to talk, me and my wife, she <laughs> she's... She's a biblical counselor. She's got a degree in uh, biblical theology. She's got her bachelor degree. And so she's a very uh, a biblically oriented. And not only that, uh, I did pray that God would send me a wife that loved Jesus more than I do. And he answered that prayer. And poor Jenny ended up with a knucklehead like me. But uh, she is really astounding with her gifted ability to point out my maybe I'll say it forthrightly, sin, but because she asks questions. Or she'll say, have you prayed about that? Or she'll ask it in a way that's diffu- uh, diffusing and not escalating the situation. And it cuts to the heart. And she's right. And, uh, and what I've, <laughs> and I've learned, I've learned to listen uh, but at the same time, she is the more delicate instrument. You know, they call, you know, in Ephesians, the you know, honor the wife. She's the more uh, delicate instrument or the weaker vessel. You could describe that in different ways, you know. She's more delicate of a instrument like a microscope would be. And they're delicate. And they have to go, they have to be cared for specifically. But they're, they're fine-tuned instruments. 
in the Lord's hands where I'm more like a dump truck, you know. Mm. And so we, I have to understand uh, her, you know, she's delicate and I have to be careful that I don't run her over and listen to her when she, she sees something that because of her intimate relationship with the Lord, she'll see it and then she'll be able to express it. Not always, but most of the time, that's uh, she's the number one instrument of God's counsel in my life. After the Lord, as who is my wonderful counselor, she becomes number two as an instrument of God's Amen. counsel in my life. So, yeah, thanks for asking about that question. Well, and something I've said to my wife before, that uh, re- recognizing that even if I think something was said badly, even if I think that uh, she brought up something with a bad motive. You know, in the Old Testament, the Lord spoke through a donkey. (laughs) And if you think your spouse is (laughs) acting like a donkey, God can still speak through them. And that's why we need to come back and say, first of all, is it true? Is God speaking to me? Yeah. Um, Let's move on here to uh, chapter 4. He starts off with very solemn words. He uses the word solemn here in my translation. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience, there's patience, and instruction. Now, we're talking to a lot of biblical counselors here, people who are disciplers. And let me say that if you don't consider yourself a, a biblical counselor, you are in the you are called to disciple people, whether it's your children or people just within your sphere of, of reference. So how do you preach in in the counseling or discipleship context? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I would say we are all counselors. Okay, so I get a phone call. You get a phone call. Hello. And they dump on you. You won't believe what just happened to me. Thus and such. What do you think? You're either going to give good counsel or you're going to give bad counsel. You're either going to give biblical counsel Or are you going to give unbiblical counsel? We all counsel. We're all called to counsel because uh, that's just part of discipleship. And I think that's uh, one part of it. But I charge you, therefore, there's a charge before God and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, who will judge the living and dead. You know, this is a heavy responsibility that I will stand before God with the advice I give. But I'm to preach the word, declare the word, proclaim the word in season and out of season to convince when people are uh, not convinced about the reality of heaven and hell and eternity and issues pertaining to life and death and exhort even coming alongside with all long suffering because a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I think I think the preaching and teaching are, are, you know, something to talk about, but I think biblical counseling is a lot of times one-on-one expository teaching or topical teaching. So, for example, um, if, if I'm sitting down with somebody to bring counsel, I'm typically opening the Word and just explaining the Word, and I think that a biblical counselor often has the gift of teaching because that's what we do in a counseling situation is we teach doctrine and we teach the word and we do it with long suffering and it says preach the word with teaching right there in verse two well and i uh going along those lines uh people not enduring sound doctrine uh, in our day, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. People changing churches all the time yeah. because this person or that person makes them feel good. Uh, we can look on television at the at people with big congregations that are very positive, that don't mention sin, won't want to mention sin, and 
very purposefully don't, and yet that's not the full gospel. Yeah. Uh, and just making people feel better doesn't necessarily lead them to Christ. And yet some people think of counseling as making people feel better. Yeah. Yeah, restore my comfort zone is yeah. what they'll say. Rather than bring uh, conviction and transformation and change of life, and sometimes that trial, that difficulty, that impossibility that God is allowing in a person's life it is what drives them to counsel. And if we give them sound doctrine and, you know, like verse 3 says, and not what their itching ears want to say, just, but we're not going to be harsh. We're not going to be unloving. We're just going to be, I guess, truthing in love. And we want to share with people the truth. And sometimes relationship needs to develop before uh, people are going to receive that truth. Because, you know, it's been said, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. And people want to know that you love them before they're going to receive a rebuke or a correction or instruction or a training or discipleship. A relationship has to be developed. A lot of times what I find as a pastor that people wander into the church uh, and they sit and they kind of, you know, they listen for a while, then they soften up and then they approach you and then they want to pray to receive Christ or they want to be baptized that they've already received Christ so you want to be more uh, walk in obedience. But other times people come in and they're broken. They're crushed, and a brood, bruised reed he will not break, and he, a smoking flax he will not, uh, you know, snuff out. But God wants to, uh, often you find people that are broken by their sin, and they're finally ready to come to God. And that is the low-hanging fruit uh, that, you know, is where the counseling can be super successful because a person is humbled and they're, they're not out looking for entertainment and itching ears and comfort zones, but they want real change because they're just tired of what the world has been doing and leading to, uh, uh, you know, no success. Yeah. Well, and, and again, we, as we continue here, he's, he's talking about these people turn away from the truth but tells us or tells Timothy here, to be sober in all things and endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist in fulfilling his ministry. Talk a, a moment, if you will, about the counselor and doing the work of an evangelist. Yeah, you know, so I think I think Ephesians, you know, I was just thinking about Ephesians chapter 4, the fourfold, everybody calls it a fivefold, but I call it a fourfold, uh, you know, ministry uh, <clears throat> that he gave himself, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor and teachers. I would say it's a teaching pastor in that phrase there. So, and it's for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's kind of what we've been talking about right here, is that there are some evangelists. Some are gifted evangelists. Uh, they're able to be sensitive to notice somebody is ready to hear the gospel and to repent. And they are able to declare to them that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the penalty of that sin is death. And death is eternal separation from God in a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And it's a place of torment called hell. And that God, though, that's the bad news, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe would not perish in hell, but have everlasting life in heaven with him. And that if we would believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died, that he rose again from the dead, that I would be saved. And these kind of messages that go forth, I have to tell people because I've been rescued. And I must, must tell people about the rescuing work of Jesus Christ. We are wrapping up now, and with that gospel, <laughs> if you're Amen. listening and you don't know Jesus, uh, let us know in the comments. We'd love to pray with you. Hey, 
Uh, Dr. Bill Hines, it's such a blessing to be with you. You're teaching Sunday. Now, what are you going to teach on? I, I think you've got 30 seconds to tell us, and then we're going to say farewell to our online podcast listening audience. I'm going to teach on Titus 2 and on the blessed hope and the things that accompany what it means to look for the blessed hope, looking for the return of Christ. Because Paul tells us there, he tells Titus, that as we're looking for his return, it will affect the way we live. Yeah. And just like we're talking about here, I hope you can tune in if you hear this in time to know to uh, or watch it later because that's an incredible passage in Titus 2 about uh, looking for the blessed hope and how to live in light of that. Awesome, and I'm looking forward to that. Hey, God bless you guys. Thanks for listening, and this is Jeff Christensen with Dr. Bill Hines. We love you, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. You can learn more at jeffchristensen.org. That's jeffchristensen.org. And be sure to share this podcast with a friend. Well, may the Lord richly bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.